So what, what we're going to talk about is, at the end of in the last session today is, a, um, is the founding of a, a new country, not a country as we've thought of countries in the past, not a, not a geographical place, not by kicking out the existing people that run the existing country, but um, by establishing a new environment um, that allows us to actually conduct commerce in the way that God designed it to be done. And the reason that I have found no better way to describe it than a country, um, as, even though that leads people to all the wrong ideas and they make it sounds like I'm a crazy person and stuff, is um, because legally that's kind of how you have to do it. Um, but uh, all it really means is that you accept a terms of use, just like a credit card has a terms of use, that puts you under a different dispute resolution process. Um, that's all it really means. But it does mean that you have to do all the things that you do when you found a country. So when you're going to start the pilgrims coming to the United States, for, you know, before it was the United States, it was just America, um, to found a colony, they had to worry about all sorts of things. They planned the founding of the original colony in Plymouth Rock for many years before they actually got on a boat and then came here. And then half of them died. <laughs> and it was because of religious freedom that they came. Um, you know, Jamestown had a different story, but um, not as many people died. Uh, but it was, still, it was still rough. You know, being a pilgrim isn't necessarily for everybody. Um, and there were a small number of people, actually, that got on the boats that came over. But there were a whole bunch of people that basically helped them <clears throat> before they got on those boats to make the journey. And there was a whole bunch of people that eventually came, including us <laughs> or our descendants. You know, so somewhere somebody came here. Unless you're an American, you know, Indian native, you came from someplace else. And you came from someplace else because you, or your parents or your parents' parents or somebody in your family line thought they would be able to have a better life. And, and so what we're gonna talk about is a better life, what it would look like to be in a better place. Um, and what that better place, how do you get there? Now, having now distracted you with something that sounds woo woo and crazy, um, <clears throat> I need to kind of recenter you because I want to talk about what it'd be like to live in a kingdom country. So when God designed Israel, what did he mean it to be? And what would a modern day version of what he intended look like in today's world today? Um, well, the, the laws wouldn't be based on the weaponization of courts. And... <clears throat> You would be able to have, this is the most crazy thing, it sounds like a nutcase stuff, but you'd have net worth that you could never lose. Net worth you'd never lose. And everything would be based upon a modern interpretation of an understanding of scripture, which has been lost. That's what I want to help you understand, is that, there, that we do not any longer understand what scripture actually says. Um, <clears throat> You would be able, through the use of your own commerce, to change culture. You wouldn't have to vote your own team in to change culture. You'd be able to do it by banking, shopping, the normal things you do. You'd be able to make a material and spiritual difference for yourself, your neighborhood, others, whether or not they agreed to or thought what you were doing was a good idea, <clears throat> you would just be having that effect. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and everything you buy for your business or your life would cost less and less and less and less over time, which is 
flip, flips everything on its head. You don't need to amass more wealth. You just need to reduce more cost. Do you understand the difference? Um, God's system works that way. Um, and I didn't know that. <laughs> you would be able to, in essence, participate in an alternative world, the kingdom of heaven, without actually moving or losing your citizenship where you are. Um, you'd be able to create value in that new world, both in the material world today and also, sorry about that, I just slapped the mic, um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and also storing up treasure in heaven. And you could borrow money at zero interest um, and the return to the person who loaned it to you, not just money, but any other asset, by the way, would actually be paid for by the economy, not by you, uh, which is how God designed the system. And this is really crazy. You would be able to give away 23.33% of, of the wealth that you caused to be generated. <clears throat> and no matter how much that was or who you gave it to, it would always come back to you. It would always come back to you. Now I sound like a nutcase for sure. Um, <clears throat> and all of this is possible without a central actor uh, or leader um, because it is all based on a set of protocols, which we will discuss what a protocol is, um, that are rules and regulations, laws, um, uh, behaviors, however you want to think about them, um, that everybody just adopts and follows. Um, and this would lead to the ability to take the joy that you experience when you have an encounter in worship into the marketplace, into the things that today are messy and, and, and confusing. And it would take the greed and avarice that everybody basically depends upon today and, and provide mutuality and unity and the sharing of benefits, not through some socialism or communist kind of structure, um, and not be out of just pure benevolence uh, um, either, but in a way that God designed for Israel that um, has not been understood yet very well, except during special times in history. And every time one of those special times occurred, there was a massive revival, and that revival unseated a principality that never recovered. Never recovered. Um, <clears throat> And the gross imbalance that exists today, uh, we'll see in a minute, um, would be changed. So what if you could live in a better economy? An economy modeled on our best understanding of God's economics. An economy owned by its citizens, not by governments or organizations, but without overthrowing your government or organization or changing it in any way. So without moving. An economy that's like a virtual country that anyone anywhere can join in any country. Built from the ground up on kingdom principles and economics, a shining city on a hill that has its purpose is to disciple nations, to show them how it's done, to create little models that say, this is how you do it. You want these results? Just practice these practices. That allows everyone to taste and see that the Lord is good, not just those who are good, not even those who are forgiven, everyone, because God causes the sun to shine on everyone. Built on love and relationship instead of fear and greed, an economic system that we have today is broken, and it doesn't matter which one. I don't care what ism, despotism, socialism, capitalism, communism, every single one of them is called by God Babylon, and for a very real reason. Now, when, you, when you're offering something new, you have to kind of explain, well, what's wrong with what we have today, right? <laughs> so what's wrong with Babylon? Well, first, um, 
90% of all the wealth is owned by 10% of all the people, okay? Now that's ownership, but there's actually a much more insidious truth, and that is that 99.9% .9 of all the wealth is controlled by less than 100,000 people. I want that to sink in. So less than 0.1% of all the wealth in the world is controlled by you. The rest is controlled by other people, the vast majority of whom do not have your best interest at heart. They don't like what you stand for. They aren't interested in, in the, the, the system changing because whether they own the wealth or not, if they control it, they can do with it what they want. Now this creates something that we didn't even have the theory to understand until 10 years ago called an economic black hole. Um, economic black holes are an amazing theory that has emerged that has explained more about economics and economic systems than any prior model has ever explained. And they work exactly like black holes in space. They are concentrations of wealth that are so vast that all they do is strip value by their very existence. And they actually slow down the growth of the economy. So the more, the more you have a supermassive black hole, and a supermassive black hole can be anything, a government organization, um, a corporation, a person, doesn't matter who the entity is, anywhere you have a massive amount of value controlled by a, very, by a single individual or a small set of individuals, you create an economic black hole. And economic black holes warp reality like black holes in space warp space and time. And they change the rules of the economics the closer you get to them until when you go over their event horizon, they strip everything from you. Now, this is not what God had planned. And we now understand what causes these. And it's a law. You can look it up if you want. It's very interesting. It's called complexity at scale. And what it is is that the benefits of scale, which is the green line, continue up to a certain point at which they cross a red line, which is the cost of complexity. And this is why a bill in Congress cannot be written that is actually less than 2,000 pages. You literally cannot write it. It could be the stupidest thing. Let's paint the room. <laughs> you couldn't write it for less than 2,000 words. And the reason is, is there are so many other laws <laughs> that you have to take into account and have to explain how this law affects that law that you cannot write a law with less than 2,000 pages, even if it's just to paint the room. Well, this is complexity at scale. This is why Amazon now is more expensive than other choices when it used to be the cheap guy. It's not anymore because of complexity of scale. Supermassive black holes are a super bad idea. They create poverty, unless you're the person who's at the center of them or one of their minions. God's plan was to, for a means of economic pr uh, production to be distributed, and there would be massive differences between one party and the next because of um, serendipity, God's blessing, um, because of wisdom application, and because of people being foolish or having calamity that occurred in their life. Massive differences that could occur. You will have the poor with you always, but there was not supposed to be any capacity for systemic poverty to exist. And his system, actually, when you model it, will not allow it, doesn't allow it to exist. Now, one of the reasons this is so important is that if you have value um, distributed a bunch of, uh, across a whole bunch of people, it's very hard for one party to capture and corrupt it because it's easy to move. You know, even militarily, it's hard. In fact, when Israel didn't have a king, all the attacks of the surrounding nations weren't able to steal its wealth. It was only, people were only able to steal its wealth when people did stupid stuff that God told them not to do, like centralize all the wealth. I'll, I'll, I'll show you that. But Moses literally said, do not do that. <laughs> do not do that. Solomon then went ahead and did it. And yeah, he was wealthy, but... <laughs> 
he laid the foundation for Hezekiah to show an emissary from Babylon all of the wealth that sat in the temple, and they, and, and they recorded that. And then when they had a budget crisis and needed to figure, figure out how they basically were going to pay the bills, one of, the peop- one of their scribes said, hey, I know where we can get ourselves a bunch of money. <laughs> it's all over here in one place. So they went and got it. Okay. Um, and then leadership. We have an entirely, this is an amazing thing. There is actually one of the most foundational things I learned in this whole process is there's really no difference between what God said in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament, it's just that we misunderstand it in the Old Testament. The New Testament, what Jesus did is he recorrected his audience's understanding of what the Old Testament said. That's what he did. He reframed it. He extended it. He expanded it. He revealed more. But he basically taught the same stuff. One of it was about leadership. And Moses said, hey, when you get a king, a leader, don't let him use power to intimidate. Anyone ever been part of a corporation that forced you to do something you didn't want to do? Or a government that forced you to do something you didn't want to do? Okay, well, that's intimid- and, and, and where the threat was something, that's intimidation. It wasn't, but don't, don't, get, don't allow them to get a bunch of horses. It wasn't about ponies. It, it was about war horses. War horses were a form of intimidation to get the people to do what they wanted them to do instead of actually volunteering to do it. Don't take a bunch of wives. Well, this is a generally good principle anyway, I can tell you. <laughs> but the wives that were being discussed here was the practice of building alliances with parties that were not of the same culture in order to create trade deals so that, hey, you won't attack me, I won't attack you because I have some of your you know, grandchildren, you have some of my grandchildren, um, you know, we're not going to attack one another, and, oh, by the way, we'll work for each other's best interest. Um, well, when you're working for the best interest of people that don't have the same values as you do, um, that's actually a major problem. So when you make deals with people that you need by honor to basically do things to honor them, to take care of them so you don't violate your arrangements with them, you set yourself up for problems. And then don't, this is the most important one, don't accumulate a bunch of wealth. Moses literally said, do not allow the king to gather a bunch of gold and silver. Don't do it. Um, by the way, Solomon broke every single one of those. He was, a, he was a wise man, but he was really stupid when it came to God's word. <laughs> he didn't follow it, and he set Israel up for failure in the future. Um, well, what are you supposed to do as a leader? Well, you're supposed to internalize God's word so well, Moses said, that you can write it with your own hand. You can write it, his word with your own hand. So you're supposed to know it that well. That's a sign of a leader that they can write God's word with their own hand. Next is you need to carry it with you and ponder it every day. We, it wasn't about, you know, the Jews, they tied scripture on their body and their forehead and all sorts of crazy stuff, which was, you know, symbolically good maybe, but it was not really the point. The point was to get it into your heart where it actually is something that you start to understand. You become so familiar with the real thing, you can recognize the counterfeit. And that is so that when you come to the problems that anyone in leadership faces, because people bring, when you're a leader, I can tell you when I ran a global company, when somebody wanted to meet with me, it was never good news. (laughs) Rarely was it, oh, we just won this big deal. (laughs) Because you heard about that before they wanted to meet with you. If they wanted to meet with you and get a meeting on your calendar, it was bad news and you had some problem you had to deal with. (laughs) When people bring you the problems, You have to be so familiar with what the word teaches. You have to have pondered it so well that you know how to rightly divide the word of truth. By the way, all this stuff is what Jesus meant by being a servant leader and washing the dirt off the feet of the disciples in the model of his last day was he didn't go around washing people's feet. He never did that. What he did do is go around and cleaning up people's mental models. Just watch what he does in any of the encounters when people come to him and ask questions. He cleans up their mental model to teach them what reality is really like. And and so you have to be able to recognize what it is. 
So we're at war. There's two war. There's a war going on. I'm sorry. The bad news is you got born into a war zone. Um, the good news is you got a you got an insurance policy that you can get to to you know so it's okay. Um, but Babylon is transactional. The kingdom is relational. Babylon is extractive. The kingdom is mutual. Babylon is win lose. It's okay if I enter deals where I win, you lose. That's perfectly okay. The kingdom is win-win. We either lose-lose or win-win together. Babylon is manipulative, uses coercion. Uh, kingdom is free choice, on and on and on. Anyway, it's time to say goodbye. Bye-bye, Babylon. So why leave Babylon? Okay, it... What were some of the justifications? The most important reason is because God said to, but even if you ignore that, it's because there's actually a better way. And, and the devil doesn't want us to know this. So um, when I said God said to, okay, to the New Testament, last book, at the end of the story... Um, in that book, just before all the good news, <laughs> um, is come out of her. It's a, it, it, it's a it's a a it's a command. It is not a choice. It's do it. And why? Well, it's so 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 you don't receive any of her plagues. Now, the, in other words, because you'll be blessed. Don't focus on the negative. We tend to focus on the negative. But there's a thought in, Jew, in, in, in um, Hebrew that doesn't translate well to English. Um, and, that, uh, and, and this was written in Greek, so I'm not saying it was written in Hebrew. But, um, but the Hebrew mind was conditioned by this thought. When we, say, when we get the word interpreted uh, curses or cursed or a blessing or whatever, we think of it as an active action because that's what it means in English. When we say, oh, you're blessed, you know, um, we, we think something active has happened. In, in Hebrew, the concept is state. You're, you're, you're in a blessed state. You're in a cursed state. It's the result. It isn't the active action. It's not because you got cursed. It's that you are cursed because bad stuff's happening. You are blessed because all this good stuff's happening. Okay, um, so it's the result. So God it wants His people not to suffer the problems of being in Babylon, which is why He's telling us to leave. Now, why? All right, this is really a massive revelation, but that's very hard to understand. Why did God, in, in Revelation, why, why does he pick to choose a whore? He says, Babylon the Great. So John sees this vision, and he sees this picture of a woman, and he's so taken by it that he doesn't know what this is. And it's really, it's this really incredibly powerful image. And he's told that that's Babylon the Great, the great whore. Well, why is Babylon a whore? Um, is it about sex? Well, I, I went and looked it up, and Babylon wasn't particularly known for sexual promiscuity. It wasn't even the creator. You know, it's not where, you know, whoredom came from or anything. It, wasn't, it didn't come from Babylon. It was around a lot longer than that. Um, so why was it considered a whore? Well, um, the more research I did, the more I actually found, well, what was Babylon known for? Well, it's known for something called the Hammurabi Code. That's probably one of the things it's known for, which is King Hammurabi was a famous king. And he created he's what is known as uh, modern law. Came from him. And in modern law, he created something called the artificial legal person. And uh, artificial legal person is, a, is your company, it's your government, it's your church, it's, okay, uh, anything that is a legal entity that is created by a government and treated as a person is an artificial legal person, okay? Uh, Babylon created that. 
It was called an association, had a board of governors, and what happened in the culture is that people switched from the wor started switching from worshiping idols and going to temple with their offerings to offerings to the association in exchange for the association agreeing to take care of them. All right, now this finally, I puzzled on this for a long period of time, but then the penny dropped. A whore is fake. It's fake love, it's fake pleasure, it's fake sex. A marriage, which is based on a relationship, is, is real. I believe that it's fake. And God hates fake so much, by the way, that in the early church, the only people that got killed were not the heretics, but Ananias and Sapphira. And what'd they do? They faked economic unity early in the church's life by saying, oh no, we gave up everything too when they sold their property. And they didn't, they faked it. Um, <clears throat> Babylon is transactional. And when we live a life where everything we do is based on a quid pro quo, and we assume, well, to do any, get anything from you, I have to give something to you, there cannot be any grace, there cannot be any love, there cannot be, and we don't, we don't think that way, and we break the image of God because God doesn't treat us that way. We don't do anything for God and he makes us his son and daughter. We don't do anything. There's no quid pro quo. There's nothing we could quid pro quo. <laughs> that transaction, we can't write the check. We're bankrupt. <laughs> we don't have the money. So the difference between Babylon and God is that Babylon does everything in a transactional world. Everything is transactional. Everything is about what, do you, what did you do for me today? Um, where everything in the kingdom is relational, it's covenantal. There is no quid pro quo. It's, it's I do this out of grace and love instead of doing this because you did something for me. So an artificial legal entity is fake. Now, I, by the way, I'm not trying to say you can't have a company or something. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying when your allegiance becomes to the artificial thing that's transactional, you make it an idol. You don't think you worship idols? I'm afraid you do, because I do. And an artificial legal entity is treated as if it's alive. Actually, in law, we treat it as a person, as if it's alive. By the way, AI is about to make this go to a whole new level. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you give it the fruit of your labor, just like you did with the idol. You gave it your offerings. You do that because you're hoping it will promise to take care of you as long as you serve it. Promise to take care of you as long as you serve it. Rewards your obedience and punishes your disobedience. Don't follow the procedure, what happens? You know, is that how you treat your kids at home? Probably not. You probably won't have kids hanging around very long if you do. <laughs> um, controlled by an elite few, both of them are the same. When we switch our alliance to depending on things because of what we give to something else, in exchange for getting something from it, then everything we do and experience does not enable anyone else to see what God looks like. We cannot display the, the character of the Father. And there's another big problem. Artificial legal people have plug-in brains and hearts. You switch the leader, you get a different behavior. Anyone gone to a church where they change the senior pastor? Anyone been in a company that changed the CEO? You change the person, you get a different behavior. You cannot have a relationship with a company. You can't have a relationship with a political party. You can't have a relationship with a government. You can have a relationship with people in it, 
but not with that thing. And so this is what's wrong. All right. I'm going to try to move really, really fast here. Okay, there's a couple deceptions I need to, help to kind of introduce. Um, the first is economics is about money. It's not. It's about incentives. Um, economics has, this was one of the great, real, I thought economics had to do with money. It doesn't. <laughs> Money's the mechanism we use to measure economics because we don't have any other measurement mechanism. <laughs> but it's really about incentives, rewards, and motivations. Second great deception was that I always thought the government created the economy. Um, it doesn't. There's not a single historical example of a government ever creating an economy. Economies are created by cultures. Uh, therefore, the way an economy gets created is you follow a set of rules or commands as a group. So when it's adopted by a group, and then you create a reward system to reward the parties who basically follow the rules and commands, okay? That's how economies are created. They're created by any collective group. You can have sub-economies in any economy. In fact, you always do, like the drug economy and the, you know, all, all sorts of um, alternative economies. Um, and this is, uh, leads to an amazing truth. You cannot separate culture from an economy. So if you want to change the economy of your city, you can't change the economy of the city unless you change the culture of the city. But conversely, you can't go out and just start you know, evangelizing the city and think you're going to change the, change the city economically or culturally unless you change both. You have to change both. In fact, I went back to see if this is true. And in every major revival that actually went into the culture and changed something, they created an economy. They changed the economy to match the culture. So, this is the truth. No change to culture will be sustained unless you change the economics. You will not change the culture unless you change the reward system that rewards the behavior people adopt in the culture. I mean, it just makes sense, right? <clears throat> and therefore, the opposite's true. No change to economics can be sustained unless you change the culture. So the reason that like the Bitcoin people and all that stuff aren't actually doing anything that actually changes anything that's led to hyper-capitalism instead is because even though some of them are, have some really good hearts, they don't get it. You have to change the culture and they're not doing anything to change the culture. In fact, they're trying to actually leverage the existing culture, which then leads to all sorts of problems. So because the economy is the reward system for the culture, Money is the points system used by the economy, uh, economies that governments create to basically reward you for doing what Babylon wants. <laughs> All right, now this is, this is axiomatic. Therefore, you can't create a kingdom culture using the reward system for Babylon culture. It cannot be done. You're using the wrong incentives. The Babylonian economy, and this is why, doesn't value kingdom culture. So it's not gonna reward it. It's about extracting money from people. <laughs> so it's not, gonna, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna reward you for not extracting. This is why like all of the, my sister was heavily involved in some nonprofit stuff, you know, big, big, big ticket nonprofit things. And what you have to do is you have to basically woo the donors with, in essence, you know, all sorts of incentives that basically get their name put out there and, you know, allow them to basically pretend that they're such a great person because they're trying to do all sorts of social signaling about how they're really good, even though they're super rich. And um, that's all it is, okay? They're creating an incentive structure that is compatible with Babylon by just using the Babylon system. That's all that's happening. All right. By the way, this is why if you really want to follow what God teaches in his word and why so many people that come up here to Reading to go to be part of Bethel and whatnot are stripped of value and wealth. It's not because of lack of God's blessing. It's because... You haven't changed the economy to match the culture. Newsflash. 
Until you do that, that will be everybody's experience. So there's three societal transformation pillars, protocols, culture, and economy. And God's plan has always been teach godly protocols. A protocol, by the way, is something like TCPIP, which is the stuff that runs the internet. And if you want to operate any kind of technology on the internet, you have to support TCPIP, which is the communications protocol that's used on the internet. Um, that's what makes web browsers work. It's what makes your apps on your phone communicate with servers. And it's how your email moves. It's how your messaging goes. You know, when you send a text message, it's how Facebook can run. Now, if you ignore the rules of TCP IP, you will create a really buggy program that won't work. <laughs> OK? Um, in the same way it is with reality from God. If you ignore what God had to say, you're going to create a really buggy life that just won't work, or you're going to create a really buggy culture that won't work. It might work for a few, kind of like a casino. You know, a lot of people go to the casino, and there are some people that have stories about, look at all the money I won. <laughs> but there were a whole lot more people that went to Vegas and didn't come back with anything. That's what develops the culture. The culture has to create the economy. When you do these things in God's way, you get blessing. Now, God knew this. This wasn't a news flash to him. It was a new flash to me, but not to God. Which is why he gave the job of teaching the protocols of God to Levites in the Old Testament, disciples in the New Testament, and families in both Testaments. <laughs> so the Levites and disciples were to create the culture and the economy. And, when, and church, by the way, focuses most of the time not even on culture. They just focus on an experience at church that will get you to have a great feeling. You know, you have a great, great result. But they don't even, you know, most churches aren't actually affecting the culture at all. When they move out to try to affect the culture, if they don't actually change the economics, if people adopt God's system, but you don't put God's economy to play, what happens is you will just lose all your money. Okay? This is what will happen. All right. I'm going to prove Jesus said this. <laughs> Super famous passage. Completely misunderstood. <laughs> Teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Okay. Go make disciples, you know, we're going to go out, we're going to bring people to the Lord, you know. Great, all right. Well, what are you supposed to do with them? Make them disciples. We're going to put them in Bible studies so they understand scripture. No, that's not what it said. We're going to basically put them in encounter rooms so they understand the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what he said. I'm not saying that the, either of those things are bad. I'm saying that's not what he said. <laughs> um, what he said is teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. What he's saying is teach God's protocols. Teach my protocols. Teach the thing. So, so what did he say? We said stuff like, don't take offense. We live in the most offended culture that has ever existed in the history of man. But he said, don't take offense. He said, look out for the benefit of others to the degree you work, look out to the benefit of your, yourself. So give others favor in your transactions. Do we do that? No. He said lots of things that we don't teach and we don't do because, oh, you can't win your way to heaven. This isn't about winning your way to heaven. This is about bringing the kingdom. You get a free pass to heaven because of Jesus died. Everybody, the world's worst killer <laughs> gets that. So how do you create a kingdom economy to go with your kingdom culture? without controlling the government or changing all the laws. Well, you have to come up with a kingdom reward system. So this is actually what we get to in the book, is how do you do that? One that lowers cost, uh, because by the way, um, real economic activity, if you were actually allowed to benefit from it because the government wasn't trying to mask what's really going on, everything would become cheaper and cheaper, including your house. 
I know that's really bad news for everybody who invests in real estate, but in a real economy that is actually not being manipulated by currency, um, as the economy grows, you would actually, everything would get cheaper because actually that's what happens when the economy grows is there's more wealth um, created. Everything becomes something called more efficient. And when it becomes more efficient, everything should become less expensive. But because that would actually not help people that are wealthy, because it would actually mean their money that they stuck in accounts somewhere would become less and less valuable, we have gamed the system so that we trick you into believing that things become more expensive when all we do is print more money. Okay, um, and I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Um, so if you want to have a real economy, what you want to show people is how, the real, the, how economics really works. That means costs will go down, not up. And by the way, this is a good thing. I'll show you about later. So you want a reward system that is based on God's kingdom. And oh, by the way, because of technology, we can now do something super cool. We can actually use tech to teach you the protocols and commands. We can use tech to measure the adoption of that within a group. And we can use tech to basically provide rewards to people on mass scale. And it's not that technology is good, it's that technology is an enabler, it's just a tool, it's just a mechanism that allows you to get more leverage for less effort. That's all it is. Um, God didn't need technology to do anything. Now, just to end this session, I want to give you a real example of where a real group of people changed their protocols, changed their culture, and changed their economy at the same time. They didn't use all of God's stuff to do it, but that's the city of Singapore, or the country of Singapore. In 1965, Singapore was a mosquito-infested swamp. That's the picture on the left. In 1999, 25 years later, that's the picture on the right. It became the envy of the world economically. Now what happened is if you owned part of the GDP of, if you had a right to own part of the government's GDP, okay, a thousand dollars worth of GDP in 1965 became six thousand four hundred and sixty-two dollars in uh, 25 years later, okay. That, that, would have, that value increase happened for the government who owned the economy without it doing anything. It just got it, not because it invested. Any investing they did would have been above that. This is just the amount of increase that was experienced in buying power in the culture. At the same time, in the United States, that number went from 1,000 to 2,161. Um, now, there could be, there's lots of reasons for this, but the important thing to understand is Singapore got the results they got because Chairman Lee changed, he, he changed the rules. He changed the laws. He changed them because he wanted to change the culture. He then changed the culture and he put in place an economic system that was compatible with the culture and he got a different result than we get when we, we don't change the rules and laws to create a better culture. We change the rules and laws to create a worse culture. And we don't actually set up a new economic system that's any better. We basically double down on an economic system that isn't working very well. Um, and that's the result we get. If we took this 25 years forwards now, by the way, it's a whole heck of a lot worse. Uh, but I didn't want to depress you because it's, it's so anyway. <laughs> This ends the first session, and I wanted to stop for a second and take questions, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take a break.